Thank, thanks, Kate. I'm rather overwhelmed by that lovely introduction. Thank you so much. And it's um, a, a real pleasure to join you today. I am um, sharing my screen and hopefully you can see that. Is that all good? Uh, yes, yes, that's so, great. Look, I, I, I love showing this picture of the Brevorana fish traps because it's uh, thought to be the oldest engineered uh, system that's been created by humans. But I'm today speaking on the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal people. I'm in Canberra today. And I want to pay my respects to them and to the traditional custodians of other lands where you're all meeting and joining us today because that's really important. Now, I want to acknowledge elders who are caring for these lands and also pay my respects to the old ones who've come before and the young ones who are going to follow. And as Kate said, I'm going to be talking to you about an update on open access. And that's really good to be back here at the Research Support Community Day because last year you were actually one of my very first presentations as a fresh Australia's chief scientist. I was just two weeks into the role. So it's a real pleasure to be back addressing you again. So thank you for that. Specifically, last year, I spoke to you about my ideas for an open access model for Australia and for all Australians. And I, um, in the past year, I've spoken to a, a wide range of stakeholders. I've actually gained a greater appreciation of the opportunities and the challenges for open access in Australia. And I have to say the response has been phenomenal. And so in 2022, I'm looking forward to progressing this work. So let's firstly think about why open access uh, can make a huge difference to science. And let's look at the impact it's had on our response to COVID. So at the onset of COVID, there was an agreement that came out, I think it was championed by uh, the then chief uh, science advisor in the USA, uh, to see to work with the publishing houses to say what if we were to make all research on COVID open access without an extra fee and so what happened well what we saw was the usual time for a vaccine to be developed which is quite lengthy go from instead of being five to ten years to being a matter of you know less than a year and so normally we know we're all experts on what it takes to develop a vaccine now the clinical testing uh, the phases one, two, and three before we get to phase four, which is a mass vaccination. That can take you know, up to 10 years or more. And so for COVID vaccination process, what we saw were preclinical testing condensed to six to nine months, and where the clinical testing phases of one, two, and three were condensed also to that short time of about six months. And this was because the information was freely available. And it's something which really has inspired me to really keep pushing on this because it has shown what an impact this can have and how important knowledge is for us as the human race to be able to navigate the future. And in the work which I've been doing, just digging into this whole system, is that I came across a really great quote from the Victoria University publication into scholarly publishing models. And they wrote that back in 2009, which is just two years after most journals went online. So it's not that long ago that things were digitized. And it says here, and I'll read the quote out, even though you can read it there. It says, advances in information and communication technologies are disrupting traditional models of scholarly publishing, radically changing our capacity to reproduce, distribute, control, and publish information. So in short, the way we do science and communicate that science is changing due to the advances in technology and changes in community expectations. And as we explore options for open access in Australia, there's going to be an opportunity for us to now step back and take a broader view to examine whether the publishing system that we have is still fit for purpose for today. So I want to consider whether we might need to have some real foundational changes to make our publication system work for the modern digital world rather than just a bolt on. So this is, a, um, is uh, well, what I've found is that there's broad agreement amongst, among stakeholders that open access is absolutely needed. And the question is, how do we get there? And how do we ensure that we end up with a model that works for society as a whole? So I wanna take a step back and examine the role of, that publishers make to the publication process, research publication process, because publishers pay, play a valuable role in providing quality assurance services as well as the IT back end of the system where you probably submit your paper through the, the front end where you actually are able to find it um, on their digital service system. They also provide that gatekeeping, making sure that the papers submitted are in scope and that they meet the style of the journal. They manage the peer review process, although there's variations in that. Sometimes it's done by um, 
uh, editors who are researchers and some of it's handled by back office and there's so there's quite a range of different um, operational models. They often provide copy editing, but not always. Sometimes the uh, papers are, are done in camera ready. Uh, they uh, provide a process for corrections, corrigendums, uh, comments to be placed there. And uh, they also do the important part of providing searchable archives, providing the metadata, and just supporting that whole process of research publication, which is really critical. I mean, be, and this is because peer review provides a backbone of the trust and the integrity that we as researchers absolutely need to do our work in a meaningful way. And it's making sure that the things are high quality, they're reliable, and they are what we say they are. You know, we're not comparing apples and oranges. We're actually getting to the nub of, of research that can be trusted. And surprisingly, it's a relatively recent comer to the, to the um, in say science um, world, it's a publishing scientific field is only recent. While we know that scientific journals were launched in about the 1600s, it's actual modern peer review view didn't really hit the mainstream until last century. And in fact, it's really amazing to hear that the Lancet didn't implement peer review until 1976. But we can't deny that the academic publishing system is now very good at providing a formalized system to ensure that peer review takes place and hopefully at the best possible quality. But the academic publishing system relies on the contributions of peer reviewers to ensure high quality, reliable and trustworthy research. And in short, peer reviewers contribute enormously to the system with more than 70,000 uh, reviews provided by Australian reviewers alone in the last 12 months. And this effort is not remunerated and that's you know, an important part of the process. It's, it's, it's our contribution to the system. A recent research paper, which was published just at the end of last year, has estimated the in-kind value of these peer reviewers in Australia alone over the last 12 months is worth somewhere between $18 million to $36.5 million. So when we consider the best approach for open access, I think we need to keep all the contributions in mind. And this includes more, the more than $320 million that we spend by various libraries around Australia to pay to publishers um, last year for journal subscriptions, for article processing charges and transformative agreements. And we need to recognise the critical work of the publishers as well. So I don't want to underestimate that. However, it is important as we work to developing an open access program for Australia, that we actually understand who is producing the value, who benefits, who funds all the aspects of the process, including the content, reviewing, editing, publishing, provision of IT systems and data management. And they're just to name a few aspects of the process. So I want the development of our open access model to be an opportunity for the system to be recalibrated so that all of these contributions are recognized, the ones that are paid and the ones that are in kind. And in addition, publishers need to help us to protect the integrity of research through their processes for investigating concerns and making corrections and retractions. And I certainly know it's not a perfect system. However, I will note that when you consider the number of papers published in Australia each year, and that's about 120,000, the number of um, poor results, that's a nice way of putting our dodgy work, that we see going through to the keeper is very, very small. It's less than a percent. Oh, and it depends on um, what you count. It's probably less than 0 .0 something of a percent. So I also note that when we see corrections coming through, that it's actually a sign that the system's working as it should. And I think that open science, which is increasing digitization and even more open data being made available, we're already seeing this leading to constant improvements in the checks and balances of this system, which is only good. Now, a key feature of publish, the publishing landscape is the diversity of the different business models, which I've mentioned a bit already. From the big publishers managing huge numbers of titles, across disciplines, the small niche specialised publishers with a single journal, and there's also the society publishers. There are publishers uh, currently operating under traditional subscription models. There's ones that have gold and platinum open access models, and then there's also the hybrid models. And it's interesting to note that over half of Australia's publishing um, market is concentrated to four main publishers. But there's also a long tail, you can see up there in that green segment of about 1,100 publishers that publish 24% of Australia's uh, research articles. And these are critical contributions to our research outcomes. 
and we need to make sure that they are valued. And so I want to make sure that we're supporting that sort of uh, using the term um, bibliodiversity. And if we were to have a national approach to open access with centrally managed agreements, I expect that this will actually support these smaller publishers because they would have to deal with in the Australian context just a single point of contact for developing an agreement rather than spending time engaging with every single uh, current subscriber. And I think this is a great opportunity that this will have to offer them. Another historic feature of publishing system is the emergence of research metrics. And this is something which it doesn't matter what I'm working in at the moment, this seems to bubble up. And academia, we know, is a competitive and, um, and it has career progression and funding tied up with metrics, rankings and league tables. Metrics have driven shifts in publishing behaviour and metrics that have an impact on the transition to open access. And let's just look at the impact factor, which is probably the most well-known metric for assessing journal performance. It was initially designed to help librarians with the collection of management of their, their, um, their libraries in the 1960s. It was not used to assess the performance of researchers or influence where they publish. However, it has grown to become a standard proxy for journal quality, and it has had an enormous impact on publishing behaviour. Many of these metrics see journals ranked not by quality, but by prestige, or you could say popularity. And over time, we have shifted to an approach where publishing your work in a reputable journal specialising in the field uh, specifically can be seen as less valuable than getting into a top tier journal, uh, general journal such as Nature or Science. And this is interesting because actually, if you look at the Nobel Prize winning papers in, in physics, I was able to find that 75% of papers were actually published in discipline specific journals first. Similarly, high numbers of citations of a paper um, tend to be correlated with higher quality research. But we've seen research that shows that authors who can afford to publish in open access can actually get an uptick in their citations compared to those who are hidden behind a paywall. Since this is obviously a function of access rather than quality, it's again leading to skewed metrics that we are now using to rank people and institutions. So with many universities and um, funding metrics being tied to your publication history, I think that we're getting to a point where, you know, publish or perish divide is getting worse and not better. And so what are the metrics we need and how can we make sure we have unbiased, accurate, accurate, no, try that again, accurate way to rank research individuals and institutions. So look a bit more on the impact of metrics as this all leads to us in many cases, perverse incentives on our research community. As I mentioned just before, some of the more commonly used research metrics mean that many authors are incentivized to publish in high impact general journals over discipline specific ones. And it could be said that quality is not seen as being an important, as important as newsworthiness. This sort of news focus also means that it can be difficult to find publishers for negative or null results. Another perverse outcome is that authors find value in publishing um, very small papers. You know, there's a salami slicing so that you're able to get many rather than a few. And this is really, from my perspective, an issue because I'd rather see single paper with the full scientific story. And finally, metrics that measure the number of citations a paper has can lead to some authors engaging in excessive citation manipulation. In 2019, um, a nature survey found that around two thirds of respondents thought excessive self citation could be curved either by the removal of self citations from the citation based in metrics or removing uh, or reporting self citation rates alongside these metrics. Food for thought. So, look, over the years, we've seen massive changes to res this research system and the way research is used and broader audiences, a wider use, and the digitization is making this all come to um, the fore right now. Open access gives us opportunities to unlock even more of these benefits. And I think um, that are actually based on, on these developments. And we wanna make sure that all contributions in the system, both the uh, content, the peer reviewing, the editorial processes, as well as the IT systems, uh, the roles that the publishers provide, 
that we take them into account and are recognized as we move towards a model that's fit for the future. So open access shouldn't be considered just as a bolt on. I, make this, I want to make this an opportunity to step back and look at the system as a whole to make sure that we're accounting for all the needs and the expectations of the publication process and system. So the way I've approached the open access is by starting with the development of principles to guide the work I'm doing. So that is I'm sort of having an open access principled approach. And I just want to go through the eight principles that I'm, work, I'm, I'm using to really guide my thinking. The first is that we use and increase the benefits from Australia's existing expenditure on academic publishing and subscriptions and see how we can make that have a better impact in general for, for the investment. I want to see how we can allow people residing in Australia to freely access all peer-reviewed journal articles from the date of their publication. I want to ensure that Australian peer-reviewed journals in all discipline areas are openly accessible internationally from the date of publication. I want to recognise the role of publishers in the system and ensure the uh, sustainability of their businesses. We want to also support research integrity by facilitating the provision of quality metadata, keeping versions of record and assisting in discoverability. I want to preserve author autonomy regarding where they want to publish and where it's most appropriate. We want to use infrastructure that is user-friendly, internationally interoperable, and designed for future developments in publishing and open research. And the final one being it needs to be equitable for all stakeholders. Tough ask, but that's what we're working towards. So all in all, I think it's really important to rebalance the system. And the first and most obvious benefit of a true widespread open access system is an immediate step towards rebalancing outcomes from all those involved in the academic research community. I've already said that not all aspects of peer, uh, all aspects of peer review and the like are recognized as um, we develop our new model. And so this gives us a potential extra bargaining tool, which I think we often ignore. It's also about providing fair access to publicly funded research outcomes between organizational haves and have nots. We all want to uh, have our research findings to be as widely available as possible, because that means our work's more likely to be noticed and to have impact, which of course every researcher is keen to do. However, even though our, our approach of paying extra charges for open access is leading to increases in research literature, I don't think it's solving the problem and it's also not sustainable financially. And it simply shifts the and increases the costs and creates a new disparity between those who can access funds to pay for the open access route and those who can't because only some researchers are able to get funding from their organization or have their own personal funds to pay uh, for open access fees and often it's limited to permanent staff or dependent on where your author's name comes in the author list. So under a widespread open access model I want to address these imbalances. Something all that's really critical from my perspective is realising that we have too many people who think that our only career pathway, particularly in the sciences, uh, is to be a researcher in a university. And that's only a very small proportion of where we, um, graduates end up. I want to see a trained researcher realise that, um, well, currently, it can be very hard to make the move from academia to industry or government right? because um, your skill sets and your training is all about the ability to gather, assess and analyze data and information. Uh, and it's hard to use all your skills when access to academic literature is no longer at your fingertips. I actually found that to be a really big case coming from CSRO into the government into, and working in a government department. This in turn contributes to sil the siloing we're seeing between academia between, and government and industry. And the worst of it is that industry and government really want to access the latest research in order to really progress um, their initiatives. So with open access, your employer will no longer matter. Your ability to trial science, research literature will remain a val valuable skill and, and allow you to be accessible wherever you go. And it will lead to better outcomes for industry and government and closer relationships between academia and external employers and also create a much clearer research uh, or career pathway for people considering what do they want to do uh, when, they, uh, when they're undertaking their, their, their post-school training. 
In the meantime, it's my hope that continuing work to address metrics that feed the publish or perish mindset within the research sector will also see academic areas getting better at acknowledging skills that aren't fed by a constant churn of published papers. I want to see career pathways that take people between industry, government and academia become mainstream and not just the exception that it is currently. Open access must also lead to better recognition of all research work, including the things that aren't necessarily the sexy newsworthy stuff that's seen as highly valuable. And this is a basic work that needs to be recorded, might be the uh, repeat work. And we know that if you're going to build a skyscraper, you've got to have strong foundation. And these foundations include things such as the published work that is negative proof work or things that didn't work out as expected or null results. So how much time and money are we wasting replicating other people's experiments that didn't pay off because they just weren't reported? And so we didn't know that that's not the pathway to go. My hope is that open access makes it easier to find and cite the foundational work, not just the research that has the top billing, and that it leads to better recognition of these fundamentals, which are often um, not even uh, published. Also open access won't um, just benefit research and, and the health professionals. It's also about ramping up business innovation. We know innovation is a weakness in Australia, and you can see there's lots of government initiatives underway at the world at the moment. And our world-class research is too often commercialised overseas. And it's also hard for members of the public to have access to good research too. So where do we, as members of the community, go for information? So when I was at university, I'd take the 30-metre uh, walk across the campus at Macquarie University to their library there, and I'd use the hard copy, this is going back in time a bit, hard copy index compilations and then work my way through the shelves to bound hard copy journals. Now most of us just type into Google and perhaps Google Scholar and the result is seemingly an arbitrary collection of science, pseudoscience, news, official mes messaging and publicity material. Um, in the case of scientific papers, um, when we go to press on those to see if we can read them, they're actually not available to read mostly about 70% of the time. And although some are available. So knowledge in which now is interdisciplinary and usually requires wide reading to find the information you need. Is, um, and as a result of the, your, your search for that literature, you often have to pay article by article if you're not in an in a academic environment which has access to um, a, a library with subscriptions. And you can see where it can often cost you know, 70, uh, 50 to 70 dollars to access a paper that the costs quickly become prohibitive. So think of it in terms of, uh, I can't help myself, but um, think of uh, Harry Potter's room of requirement. You know, you can only get in if you know what you want, but how do you know what you want until you get in? So making research output more open won't suddenly make Google searches easy, but it will speed the research and discovery and improve visibility of, the, um, of um, what experts, uh, who the experts are and what their work is. And I think will spark collaboration and cross-disciplinary work, including the valuable work of our citizen scientists as well. It will even help, I think, even up the playing field between researchers in different settings, including in industry and government, and improve scientific literacy and control costs. And it might even make academic writing less opaque, you know, as the research community writes for a wider and less discipline specific audience. So I think there's lots of pluses there. I do want to emphasise that there has been extraordinary uh, progress made towards open access in Australia in the last 12 months. And we're seeing the excellent transformative agreements that have been negotiated by CORL and CSRO, showing that it is possible to have research organisations club together and work with publishers. And so this is a great start to build on. So we need to accelerate that transition to a national open access. And the broad range of stakeholders have indicated full support for the development of, no, of a national open access strategy. And that's from the Prime Minister down, which is very exciting. So next step. Well, we're in the process of preparing a discussion paper based on some work we did last year. And, uh, and it's gonna be released for public consultation in March. And the feedback will then inform an in-depth analysis of a range of options, which we'll put to government as a pathway for a national open access strategy. So that's where we're up to at the moment. And the reason why this is really critical 
is that I truly believe that research is human, um, humankind's uh, superpower. It's something that's allowed us to navigate uh, uh, the COVID pandemic, we are looking to help us to navigate uh, climate change, to have the prosperity, the uh, health and well-being, and the social cohesion that we all want and aspire to have. But to do this, or to have this and realise it, we have, um, we have to release that research to see its benefits. And so I'm hoping that you'll join me and uh, see how we can come together with this vision of making research available to all. And that um, there's an email address which you can uh, con contact now if you've got things you want to discuss or uh, raise issues or um, let us know that you would like to have you know, personal contact to uh, let, us know, let you know when the, um, when the uh, discussion paper is released. And, um, and I look forward to you joining me in, in seeing how we can unleash the amazing human knowledge that we have and make it available to all. So thanks very much. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, so just a reminder that everything's going into Padlet. So please um, uh, put the Zoria some questions, which I'll work through with Kathy. Um, now, but I'm going to take my prerogative as being the MC and ask the first question, um, Kathy, which touches on actually a few of the issues that have been raised in the questions that are already in Padlet right now. So um, in the pie chart that you showed us, we had just slightly under 50% of all of our publications being um, published across basically 1100 publishers. And what we know is if we look at that distribution um, more fully in at higher granulation, what we see is a, a real diversity in the subjects that are published across those different publishing houses. And that many of those publishing houses don't use DOI um, at the moment. Things are not findable easily for some of our disciplines. So we actually have a lot of our um, formal publications that are completely invisible, even to the academy, let alone outside of the academy. So um, what do you think, how do we ensure in thinking about an open access context that it is fair and reasonable and equitable across the disciplines? Mm -hmm. And how do we get the publishing houses to recognize that they have to play their role in terms of making sure everything has a doy? that everything is findable. So it's not just the um, philosophy of being open access, but the practicalities as well. So you, uh, you, you've you just uh, opened up the Pandora's box of how complex this is. So Sorry. no, no, which is uh, absolutely important. Uh, and that is that uh, it's not like this is gonna be something that's gonna be done in a year or a week because there's, you know, as you open up, you, and dig into it, there's more and more issues. And, um, and so you've just counted, uh, identified some of them, such as you know, the, um, the, the smaller publishers that are not in a position even to have, uh, you know, they're still in hard copy and not digitized. So this is something which we have to understand that long tail in particular. I think the big publishers, the 75% the of where we publish at the moment is, uh, that's, that's I think straightforward. And I think that's gonna be a very, I'm not so worried about that. It's actually understanding uh, what uh, what those um, 1,100 publishers are, and there's not just journals but publishers, and understand where they're at and and what their trajectory looks like. Because we are we do have to see, you know, in many, in many cases they're Australian specific. Um, what we're understanding is the feedback so far is uh, they're publishing they uh, in areas which are specific for the Australian. Um, Situation and and uh, you know things like how diversity, uh, biodiversity, environmental situation, and and also social, and um, and um, and uh, and humanities areas are, are, are there as well, and so that's one of the things we the uh, discussion paper will be trying to see if we can find out as much as we can about them. At the moment, they must have people actually subscribing to them. So we need to understand, and what's a thing that's been really interesting is how so far all the publishers have been very um, collaborative and cooperative, offering us access to information, which will allow us to get into some of the details of who is subscribing, where the all money flows, and how that all 
works because it's quite um, it's quite um, um, uh, obli uh, it's you know it's um, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the word but it's it, we can't see what it is at the moment and so this is something which uh, is under so they're going through understanding where the money flows what the types of journals are where the research areas are what is their future because we're talking about a long term program so are these uh, publishers which are really important is there a need for us to work with them to make, especially when they're specific for the Australian context, that where you know there's a, a part of work that has to look at how to support them to transition to something that is more uh, sustainable and in, you know and therefore more discoverable. These are some of the things we have to work through. I'm not going to pretend that we're across this in any stretch of the imagination, but it's a recognition of what the issues are and making sure that then you work through them and understand who are the stakeholders, who are the people that need to be. Uh, consulted in order to navigate that way through. So I know it's a bit of a wait and see, but uh, it is absolutely part of the complexity of, of turning this into something that's a reality. Okay, thanks, Kathy. There, there are four questions that have got um, good support from other people. I'm, I'm going to, just because of what you've just been speaking about, um, I'll, I'll just try and mm -hmm. keep them kind of flowing. Um, so uh, apologies to the audience. It might not come in the you know, the exact order that you might, but I'll just try and feed off of Kathy's last um, mm -hmm. uh, questions uh, and comments. So in that, you, you sort of raised some of these things, um, Kathy, but I just wonder if there's anything else that you'd like to add in terms of you specifically in your role now as chief scientist, what do you think and what influence that do you think that you have to be able to work with publishers to get them to start working and thinking and operating in this way? Uh, I'll be honest in saying I've been quite um, surprised, pleasantly surprised that, uh, so we engage, the only publisher so far which we haven't engaged with um, is Francis Taylor, but we've got plans to engage with them. We've had um, uh, many of the publishers offering uh, confidential information under, so that we can understand things, so that we don't go around showing everybody things, because these, these are all very large commercial contracts and we have to respect the laws of business and, and trade in order to do that. So, um, so, uh, so the, um, the, the, all the, um, the very large four publishers in general are um, working with us and trying to provide our support because they realize that the current system is unbalanced. Uh, they are very successful businesses and very profitable businesses. Uh, so we know that academic publishing is uh, one of the most uh, uh, most profitable businesses in the world. And so, you know, you know that when there's imbalance, that means uh, from a, if you were a, a, on a board of any of these companies, you'd be saying, how do we make sure that we don't end up uh, having a, um, a sort of like the fall of the Roman Empire, where you get to a point where you're um, you, you see an alternative uh, could be created because your system is no longer one which is able to you know, be sustained or supported. And so they're, they're very open to looking at ways, recognising you know, the role that they play. But there's also um, issues of interoperability, which I think we that's still sort of um, an issue of um, being able to access different, um, different publishers uh, work, but I think many libraries have sort that, sorted that out with front ends, so that's not so much a problem. And it's actually looking at uh, information like no one really knows who pays for um, the um, the payments you pay for the uh, article processing charges, the APCs. There's actually no um, no understanding by anyone as to who actually pays that. So, uh, so for example, one of the publishers is offered to survey all their public all their their um, Australian authors to find out who paid for them, just so that we can get that information. So that's you know, that's extraordinary. And then when it comes to the medium size, like IEEE, Institute of Physics, uh, Frontiers, Sage, those middle, uh, those thirteen middle sized ones, they're also re, um, uh, we haven't talked to all of them, of course, because it's still early days. But we're getting um, the ones we've spoken to have been very uh, supportive. We've got. Um, uh, one of the medium-sized publishers actually on our advisory committee, and they're very helpful as well. What we haven't, we've also talked with um, some of the society publishers and are trying to understand what that means for them, because uh, for many uh, professional societies, 
Uh, free uh, subscription as part of your membership is their sort of value proposition. And of course, uh, we all know that uh, professional societies are really critical and we don't want to undermine their, um, their um, sustainability and, um, and economic um, uh, ability to operate. And so these are the sorts of things which we have to work through. So you can see, depending on who they are and where they're coming from, there's quite a lot of complexity. But I think what, we're, what I'm seeing overall is a realisation that open access is coming. Uh, that they want to be part of the uh, way forward and that they are uh, at the moment open to uh, having very, very uh, free and transparent discussions, knowing that we have a vision of what we want. And also, I suppose one of the things which has been a bit of an aha for me is that the recognition of contributions has, um, has not been taken as, as much into account as far as I know. Some of the people from call might um, want to add to this, but um, the things like recognizing the in-kind contributions of the content that's provided, the in-kind contributions of the peer review process, and also uh, those who are editorial boards and editors in chief, uh, they get a paid a small amount of money, but the hourly rate is quite small when you divide the number of hours you spend for the little honorarium you get, is, is um, not quite volunteer, but pretty close to it. And, um, and so when you put that together and you look at the fact that Australia does provide 4.3% of the world's publications, so we're a small country, 0.3% of the world's population, but we are significant, you know, might sound like a small amount, but, you know, every country has is, is only got, a, uh, you know, sort of less than 20%. So when you add that all up, we, we are a voice to be listened to, and there's great interest for them to see how we can work together to have a, a model which is... Uh, is going to work for us and allows them to keep doing their business, knowing that my expectation is that scientific publishing will change in time anyway. Um, it won't necessarily, it, it will have to. And we'll probably see them become more businesses that do the, you know, provide uh, provision of publishing, but they will also have other offers. And we're seeing that already with some of the big publishers having things like Clarivate and, um, and some of their search engines. But, um, you know, as the amount of literature is, too much for any one person to be able to go all the way through. Uh, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence and, and techniques for, for being able to um, search the literature will probably in time um, be part of that, that step that us as researchers do in order to have our first, you know, first look at the literature. So there's a lot of flux there, a lot of interest, and it's very encouraging. Thanks, Kathy. Um, we, we are scheduled, well, we're past scheduled for a break. I think for the most part, I think um, what you've answered across those two questions actually touches on quite a lot of the themes that are in the mm -hmm. other uh, questions that have been yeah, posted. Yeah, been. and um, Catherine, my understanding is that we will work um, in the background to answer the questions and people can continue to load questions up and that the team will work to ensure that we, we can answer. But I think um, most of them have actually been followed in one way or another. So that just leaves me to, to thank you so much, um, Kathy. As I said, I think that the way that you have um, themed uh, what you want to focus on as chief scientist in this really critical area of publication of research and making it accessible is just one of the, the most challenging, but actually has the potential to revolutionise the accessibility um, to the greatest extent. And we'll see hopefully globally um, just over the next decade, I know it's gonna take a lot of time and it's hard work and everything, but over the next decade, I think we will see much more accessibility in terms of that. And then of course, the next bit is how do we help the public and external stakeholders to use that accessibility I well? Right. I mean, we're, we're sort of in some ways making a rod for our back, but I think it's the right thing to do. But um, uh, on behalf of everybody who's here, which is nearly 200 people, thank you so much for your time today, Kathy. Oh, Very much appreciate it. I look forward to any feedback. Please do use that email address and um, very contactable. And if you really, what I'm really looking forward to are the, uh, you know, what are the issues? If you've got any information about the long tail or the concerns, that's where we'll get the richness of making sure that we're approaching this the right way. So don't feel like you have to be faint hearted. If you've got some robust feedback, really love to hear that too. Excellent. Thanks very much, Kathy. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks.